This is the second video on retrieval log manager generation that I'm doing on this channel. That is because there are a lot of new amazing tools that I want to show you. If you have not seen the first video uh, and want to catch up on the basics, I'm going to link it here or here or somewhere here. You're going to find it. RAG is one of those things that sound really easy when you get started and when you understand it for the first time. For me, it kind of felt like when I first understood the concepts of, of containerization and Docker, and I thought like, yeah, this is so great. It just makes so much sense. I'm going to do that all the time now. and I'm going to be so happy and everything's going to be so awesome. And while that is kind of true and well, it is pretty awesome, the devil is in the details. If you actually try to build something useful with retrieval log manager generation, you have definitely realize as well is to get it right is you have to think about a lot of different things because there simply are a lot of moving parts in retrieval log manager generation. Some of the things are how you chunk your documents, what embedding model you use or what retrieval strategy or the final piece, what model for generation you want to use. But the good thing is a lot of those things, you can try them out fairly easily. And if you spend enough time, it's quite likely that you're going to find a set of parameters that's going to work a lot better than the first naive approach. And that was one of the main things that AI engineers did in, well, 2024. And the reason why I'm making this video now is because you don't have to do that anymore. Because there are tools now that can do that for you. What I'm talking about is this, Auto AI Rack. If you are familiar with Auto AI in the IBM portfolio, some of those things might sound familiar to you. Auto AI is a service that does all those hyperparameter tuning for traditional machine learning models. We can now use the same ideas for retrieval log manager generation. But before I can show you anything reasonable using Auto AI Rack, we first need some data. And that part always makes my life quite a bit hard. Because the problem is retrieval log manager generation is awesome when you feed it your own internal data, the data that is not part of large language model training data, the data that ChatGPT does not have any clue about. But the problem is that's internal data and this is a YouTube video, so I cannot use internal data in a YouTube video. So the solution that I came up with is to use a data set that is very large and very specific. And that is the IBM DB2 documentation. If I open up a few of them, you can see that they are gigantic, 1,700 pages, and that's just one of them. So I downloaded a few of them, like five different ones uh, that we are going to use as our data corpus. This is going to be the data that we are going to retrieving our data from. So much for the scenario. We're going to be building a rec assistant for EP2 documentation. But to do this in a automated way using auto AI, we need evaluation data. There are many different terms for that. You could also call it golden questions, golden answers, or you can also call it a sample solution or an A plus solution, whatever you want. In the case of auto AI, it looks something like this. This is a predefined structure and you've got the questions here and then you've got a perfect answer. And then you also got the source where this answer is supposed to come from. So in this case, those are, I think 15 questions, no, no, actually nine question and answer pairs. And getting this right is super critical for everything we're gonna do next. Honestly, I cheated big time creating this evaluation data. I simply used a large Lama model in what's next and just copy pasted parts of the original documents and had a prompt with something like, come up with a answer that can only be an answered with this text following this structure. And I just copy pasted this JSON structure into the prompt. And it worked decently well to come up with some question and answer pairs that are relevant to that text passage that I pasted in. Doing it that way is fine for a demo, I guess. But in reality, this is where you want to spend your time. Get those question and answer pairs right. You don't want to spend your days doing endless hyperparameter tuning and choosing the best model and the best chunking strategy. You want to spend your time with this. And yes, this does mean getting the subject matter experts together, getting the people that actually know the subject and have them create those question and answer pairs. And yes, this is painful. Yes, this is going to cost a lot of money. And yes, your boss is not going to be happy about it. But that is the sad truth about AI in general. And it just as well applies to Gen AI. Your solution is only going to be as good as the data that you have. But for demo purposes, this will be fine. Okay, back to what's next. Let's jump into auto AI. First, we've got the choose if you want to build a traditional machine learning model or a rack solution. Right now we definitely care about the rack solution. Let's give it a name, demo life. I'm in a very fresh project here. So I do have to do some setup work and that is to associate a what's next, a runtime service instance. This is pretty simple. There we go. And 
create and now it asks us to upload the data and i'm gonna do that by drag and dropping the whole shebang in there doing some uploading so the whole data ingestion took us like 30 seconds that was plenty easy so at this point there's one major consideration that we have to do if we just want to try things out and mess around we'll be fine with the in-memory database that is a chroma db which just going to exist in the scope of this project, which is going to work fine for all the testing that auto AI is going to do for us. But if we do it that way, we will not be able to deploy it to kind of make it available to the rest of the world. So what we're going to do now is do it the right way. And that is providing the connection to a externally hosted Milvus database. That part is going to take some effort, but it's not that tricky. I'm going to provide the instruction in the video description, and I'm just going to show you the quick rundown here. What you're going to need is just any virtual machine. And in my case, I simply got me a VM on AWS. Obviously you can do that in the IBM cloud as well, but I just want to show here, like you can literally get that VM anywhere. It, it's completely agnostic. You can put that solution together however you like. So this is a T2 medium, which is probably way overkill, but it costs like, I don't know, four cents an hour, something like that. So whatever. The only specific thing you have to do is allow those ports here. And once it's running, you can just simply follow the steps that you can find here in the UI and copy paste this string into the terminal of your choice. And when you execute this, you're going to end up on that Ubuntu machine. And if you look at the history of what I did, those seven commands are literally everything you need to get this setup running. And when you then take your public IP address here and slam the port behind it that you found in the documentation slash web UI, you're going to end up in the web UI of Milvus. So this is probably the cheapest and easiest way to get a basic Milvus instance running. If you want an enterprise grade version of that, check out what's next data because we have that in there. But for our demo, this is going to do just fine. So now that we have done that, we can create a connection in here, which is really simple. We just give it a name. Then we need the host name which in this very simple scenario is just simply the public IP. And there we need the port that we get from the Milbus documentation. And the database is called default, which is, well, you guessed it, the default database. In this simple scenario, we don't even have any credentials. Uh, we can actually type whatever in here. Not a good idea, but for the sake of simplicity, we're gonna do it that way. And yeah, we are not even SSL enabled. Well, so that should be enough if you test the connection. Yes, green. Create. So that's pretty much it already. We could just start this experiment now, but we want to dig a little deeper here. If we click on experiment settings, we can see all the parameters that we can tweak. For the main metric, we're going to go with answer faithfulness. I'm going to link the documentation so you can look up how those metrics work and how they're calculated. And here we've got two different retrieval methods that both going to be tried out and evaluated against this metric once this experiment starts running. And here we've got the foundation models that are going to be used for the generation. And well, we're going to take out Flan. It's kind of old school. I'm interested in having like a large llama model, a small llama model, and well, I guess mystery large. Why not? And we can set the maximum amount of uh, parameter combinations that it's supposed to try out. And if you check the indexing, we can do a lot of setup here on the different chunking sizes that auto AI is supposed to try out for us. But we're going to leave it at default. Those defaults are pretty good, actually. And we can also choose if it's supposed to try out different embedding models. Okay, let's save that and run the experiment. This is going to take some time. I mean, it's going to try out a lot of different setups and configurations. But, well, there's literally nothing you have to do. So, this took about 10 minutes or something, and we've got a winner. Llama 318 billion with a slate 125 million embedding model. Auto AI tried a lot of different combinations here, and there's probably a lot of information if you just, if you go through them and really look how each of them performed. But for now, we're just gonna dig a little deeper into the winner. So there's a lot of information here. For example, the design of the chunks. If we scroll down here, we can also see the system prompt is interesting but the most interesting part is down here here we can see all of our evaluation questions and every single one has this nice little pyramid thing where we can see the faithfulness the correctness and the context correctness and we can see the actual answer and compare it to the expected answer so you can see in that case that it tends to answer a lot more verbosely but still it's a really nice answer it's like it's still pretty concise and i honestly prefer that answer to our evaluation answer kind of a question of taste 
And we can go through all the answers here, which is really interesting. Having those qualitative and quantitative measurements here side by side, that gives you the peace of mind that you need to actually go forward with a setup like this. So now that we are happy with it and we've got all the data that we need to also tell our boss that we're happy with it, we can go forward. That is as simple as go to save as. And there's a variety of different options you have here, which is actually pretty awesome. And you can export all of this as a notebook where you can tinker around with it and change it, which I personally really love. But here we're gonna go the simplest way and deploy it as an AI service. The thing that I said in the beginning that you need a Milvus instance to be able to deploy this, that, that, this is what I mean. If we do this with a in-memory database, it's just this is gonna, not gonna be available. Everything else is gonna work the same. We can just leave that name, prettiest name, doesn't matter. Just create, view it in the project right away. This does look a bit surprising if you just want to deploy your code and you're like, what is this? But that's actually really nice because that's like the whole definition of the AI service, including all the actual code that you see here. We're just gonna do one more click and that is here, promote it to space. And we can just choose one of the deployment spaces we already have. If you don't have one, you can just create one. It's really simple. So now we can just jump straight to that deployment space. Now we just have to click deploy and create an online deployment and give it a name. Let's just call it like that. And then, nah, it's actually no capital letters. That should be fine. Yeah, now let's hit create. And here we have our deployment. If we click on this, we simply get the endpoints and even the curl or JavaScript or Python code that we need to use this in our application. And it's also got this nifty little test page where we can ask it a simple question. How do I improve the performance? Like th this is really naive, but it's gonna show you that it's actually going to get its answer from the documents that we provided. And even though our question was super unprecise, we get some pretty good answers. And we also get a very good reference of the exact name of the document that it came from. And also the sequence number, which can easily be translated back to the actual part of the text that was used. And to make it even easier for us, also gives us the complete text that was used to generate that answer. So. This gives you a really high performance rack system that can theoretically scale as much as you want. And well, I think it was pretty simple. To summarize this, everything you've seen here, you could have done on your own. I mean, if you know what you're doing and you've done some rack systems before, this is not rocket science anymore in 2025, but it is a lot faster to do it that way. And that frees up your time on the things that actually matter. And in that regard, it's pretty simple to say what that is. It's the data. You can spend more time creating real high quality evaluation data. So at the end of the day, using the same amount of time using Auto AI Rack will simply give you a better Rack solution than not using it. So I hope you learned something. As always, if you have any questions, shoot me a message, comment under this video, or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to chat. Bye bye.